so um, good afternoon, good abend. Um, my name is Florence. Um, just to kind of give a little introduction about myself, I'm a commercial archaeologist working in London, um, but I do kind of research into archaeo gaming um, in my spare time, so it's independent of my day job, basically. Um, yeah, and I'm, this afternoon I'm going to kind of take you through a thought experiment um, about archaeo gaming as queer gaming. So um, just to start, I've got this slide here, um, and the question is, what happened here? So this is a screenshot from a game, and if you can't quite see this clearly, um, it's a bathtub with basically some kind of red splotches in it. Um, and the reason why I'm starting off with this is because in archaeology, quite often we are kind of asking this question, what happened here? We're kind of using material remains to kind of try and work out what happened in the past. And this is something that happens a lot in games as well, where within the game world, um, uh, the player has to use the immaterial culture to try and work out what happened. Um, yeah, so um, I will come back to this scene later on in the presentation, so keep that in mind and I'll ask the, answer the question of what actually happened. So, um, what is archaeo gaming? Um, very generally, archaeo gaming can be defined as um, the study of video games um, as artifacts. Um, as immaterial spaces and as programming. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I kind of tried to distill it down into these three kind of themes, um, but it should, I should really say that these aren't really mutu uh, mutually exclusive, um, and certainly kind of the work of the different people that I've cited here probably could um, go between um, various different kind of categories there. Um, but in terms of kind of giving a general background, if we kind of consider um, representation in archaeo gaming, um, Megan Dennis, who of course is um, organising this session, um, has kind of looked at um, the representation of archaeology in games and the ethics of that. Um, and in terms of creation, for example, Tara Cobblestone has um, created games um, with an archaeological perspective and kind of looked at non-linear narrative. And in terms of praxis, um, we've got Andrew Weinhart, who's kind of engaged with games as archaeological sites in themselves. Um, and archaeo gaming kind of it, it's this kind of nascent up and coming field um, and I kind of consider it as something which does kind of disrupt the kind of traditional idea of what archaeology is um, traditionally archaeology is seen as the study of material remains of the past but this is um, as archaeo gamers we consider video games to be human created culture that sh can be studied um, through archaeology so what is queer gaming? So, um, queer gaming is a term that was coined by Edward Y. Chang in a volume called Queer Game Studies. Um, and basically what he means is, by queer gaming, is not just looking at um, queer represent representation in games, um, but also using queer as a verb. So, trying to queer games, questioning um, the kind of conventions and genres that we see in games and why that is, um, what, we take for, what we take for granted in games. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And in particular, um, he calls for modes of play that don't rely on co um, competition, violence, exploitation, colonisation, um, individualism, and um, kind of conventional win states in games. Um, and kind of as I was researching queer gaming, I kind of realised that there was um, a lot of parallels with arcade gaming in the sense that there's kind of this matter of looking at representation in games, but also kind of um, looking at kind of methodology. So that's why I kind of, again, split um, queer gaming into these three categories there. Um, and so I'm gonna, oh yeah, so sort of another point that I kind of wanted to make at this stage is if this kind of seems a bit esoteric or kind of niche, like maybe consider that um, just earlier this month, um, in response to the Parkland shooting, um, Donald Trump organised a meeting of video game executives and others um, in which they discuss um, violence in video games. Um, and one of the things that was shown is sort of like the supercut of like um, different scenes from video games which are considered to be very violent. And a lot of people kind of um, critique this because, you know, it was out of context, you know, which is a very archaeological thing to say. Um, and, you know, the reason why I bring that up is because, you know, this kind of shows how the matter of what games are, what they should be, what they can do, is incredibly political. And I think it's, you know, as important now as it ever has been. Um, yeah. 
So, okay, so we've got Arca Gaming and Queer Gaming, and I kind of want to look at these two um, through um, two particular concepts, which are permadeath and permalife. Now, permadeath is a game mechanic in which um, the player's in a game, and instead of when they die, they respawn and they can continue from a particular stage. Actually, when they die, that's it. That's the end of the game. Um, and permalife, as you might expect, is kind of the complete opposite of that. It's the impossibility of dying in a game. Um, and in her article, uh, Permalife Video Games and the Queerness of Living, Bonnie Ruberg um, kind of, she really focuses on this concept of permalife, but she says that it's only really um, evident in games that actually kind of focus on this theme. So it's not just games where there's an absence of death, but where the permalife is like a key theme of it. So keeping that in mind going on. Um, okay, so I've got three kind of case studies to look at. The first one is called Queers and Love at the End of the World, and this was made by Anna Anthropy. It's a twine game. Um, the game is so short that I can fit it into one gif, um, <laughs> which is a first for me. Um, so basically, you have 10 seconds in which you interact as much as possible with your lover before the end of the world, and then that's it. That's the end of the game. Um, and um, Bonnie Rubo go discusses this particular game and she says that actually it's not about permadeath, it's about permalife because it, the game is constantly on this cycle. Even though it, or there's always inevitable apocalypse, at the end you're encouraged to play again and again. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, that as an arcade gamer, how I'm kind of recording and presenting this game to you and it seems like a GIF is actually very appropriate because of its cyclical nature, which is kind of imitating the game itself. However, um, Ruberg herself argues that the thing that makes this game really queer is the fact that through multiple playthroughs of it, that's, it's only through multiple playthroughs that you get more of a sense of this relationship between uh, the two people. So um, using this GIF is useful, but I can't show you kind of multiple iterations of the game. It's only kind of one static version of it. Right, and... The second case study I've got is a game called Forgotten by Sophia Park. Um, this is again another twine game that you can play online. Um, and the premise of this game is basically that um, there's a computer hard drive which is kind of disintegrating and there are these NPCs, non-player characters, which over time and through various playthroughs of a game on this computer have become sentient. But the problem with this is because um, their thoughts take up hard drive space by becoming sentient and interacting, they've actually, um, they're destroying their world. Um, and you as a player, by interacting with them, that also takes up hard drive space. So basically, by interacting with the game, you inevitably end up killing them. Um, and so I found this kind of interesting on a lot of levels, really. Um, it's kind of um, queer in the sense that um, we're thinking about queer as a verb not in terms of representation. It's interesting that this game kind of is making you as the player think about the perspective of the NPC and how they have agency um, within this, which is something that I think we don't ordinarily see. Ordinarily see. Um, and it's also interesting because this whole kind of theme of like um, digital disintegration is something that's kind of um, very important for arcade gamers because we have to consider how sort of over time um, games, especially older games, uh, may not be accessible anymore and um, kind of needing to preserve um, digital data. Um, yeah. Um, and on to my third and final case study, which is Gone Home. Um, so the, this is kind of a first person exploration game. And um, basically the premise of this is that um, you're a young woman, you've, c you've come home after a year away, um, but your family have gone, you can't find them anywhere. And so you have to explore this house to understand exactly what happened. And um, <coughs> Lunis, in his article, Straightening Up the Archive, he considers that this game is basically about the archive. Uh, the house is the archive, right? Because you're having to search through to kind of understand what happened. Um, and he also specifically argues that this is a very archaeological game because in the different rooms you have assemblages of objects. Um, and from different periods in these people's lives and you're kind of trying to put together um, what went on. Um, so, returning back to this scene, uh, this is from Gone Home and um, I find this particularly interesting, a lot of people commented on this because when you enter and see this scene, I think it looks like it's 
a record of a violent event. That's kind of what the developers are making you think. But actually, um, it's not a record of violence, it's a record of queer intimacy between two young women because, as it turns out, the protagonist's younger sister um, is having a relationship with this other woman called Lonnie. Um, and this was when she was just dyeing her hair. So nothing horrible happened here. It's actually, you know, it's something... It's about kind of overturning your expectations of how games work, especially given that the game, you know, it has a lot of kind of horror game tropes, the house is creaking, there's thunder and lightning, so it's kind of setting you up to think something bad is going to happen, but actually it doesn't. Um, and going back to look at kind of um, queer as methodology versus queer representation, there is clearly queer representation in this game, but some people have argued that actually it's quite a conventional game in terms of its mechanics. So, for example, Anna Anthropy, who made the first game um, that I discussed, she says that actually it's a very linear, very kind of neat and tidy game. So again, it's a good example to kind of show the tension between those two things. Um, so, um, kind of gone full circle, back to the beginning again, um, kind of the big theme of this presentation has been kind of cycles, non-linearity, um, and using GIFs as a way of recording, presenting games as an arcade gamer. So to kind of sort of tie up, really, I just want to say that um, I think questioning what archaeology is and what games are and can be is a way of queering both and is a very productive exercise. Um, and, um, yeah, this kind of tension between queerness as uh, representation versus methodology is, also has parallels with archaeo gaming and how we can kind of look at representation of archaeology in games but also um, use an archaeological methodology and apply that to games um, and really um, for me just doing this research um, it's kind of really inspired me to hopefully try and make my own game um, having looked at these kind of twine games I realized that you know there are these tools out there which are really accessible um, and that's something I really want to do in the future I know people in the arcade gaming community are already doing this. Um, so I think really just kind of that spirit of experimentation and creation, that's something that I just kind of, yeah, want to end on. And um, I will be posting a bibliography on um, my WordPress site, um, which will have links to everything I've talked about. Thank you.